Shalom Forana beloved family, friends, and everyone tuning in. Welcome back to Forana YouTube channel. May God's delightful grace and peace rest upon each one of us. We are so pleased to announce our upcoming face-to-face -face services on 3rd and 24th August. Please note down that we will have Pastor Abis Zulkarnain with us on the 3rd August at the Bible House, 7 Armenian Street. Don't miss it! And for this week, we are so happy to share this video with you where Pastor Ankia Van der Meve shared with us about what is needed for this new life, this new beginning. Let's prepare our hearts to receive the Word of God that will strengthen us. Have a great week ahead and be highly favored. See you on 3rd August and God bless. Okay, good morning. Good morning. Did you all have a good sleep? Yes. Did you sleep? Yes. <laughs> also only a few hours? Yeah. <laughs> Amen. Okay, so this morning we're going to look at the third time that Jesus came. Remember I said last night for us to walk in this new beginning, the new beginning after Christ was resurrected. He came three times to reveal himself to the disciples and impart into them, showing them what is needed to walk in this new life. And yesterday we started by first that they had to, to get to the point of being hungry and wanting to hear his voice, know his voice, getting to the place where they could really get rid of all their fear and walk in what the Holy Spirit wanted continuously. And secondly, to do it by faith. To have that faith and to live a life of forgiveness continuously. So this morning we're going to go to the third time Jesus came and he revealed himself. What was it that he imparted to say, this is what we need to walk in this new beginning and to, to reveal what God wants to do in this new beginning. And now we're going to go to John chapter 21 which I think is, for me, a, my prayer, especially for the church in the coming days. And practically, what Jesus has revealed to them. Because when we read John 21, it says, and after this, Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples. So it wasn't the visitation. The word, I don't know how it reads in Bahasa, but in English, it clearly says he revealed himself. He showed himself in this way. So it wasn't just, hey, I'm here to have time with you. There was a revelation. There was an impartation, something that Jesus wanted them to understand. And as I'm going away, I want you to remember this. I want you to take hold of this. And the word says, in this way, he showed himself. Simon Peter and Thomas, who is called Didymus, the twin, and Nathaniel from Ghana of Galilee, as well as John and James, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples were together. And, they, and Simon said, I'm going fishing. And the one thing that the Lord showed me here is that they went back to what they knew. Many times we want the new beginning. We receive it. Remember, Jesus already said in John 20, when he breathed on them, he said, receive my spirit, take hold of it forcefully. And then he sent them out. He said, go. But where did they go? Where did they go? They went back to what they knew. They went back to comfort because they were fishermen. So they knew how to do it. And many times we, we want the new beginning and we, we pray for it. But in how we live or how we walk it out, we many times go back to what we know, how we did it before. And what was Jesus telling them? I don't want you to go back to who you've been before this. And we, we know how the story goes. As they went back, the word says they came and they said that as morning was breaking, and Jesus was there. They were fishing the whole night. But there was nothing. But there's an important question, and I don't know how many of you have read this. It says, Jesus asked them, children, do you have any fish? Now, it sounds just like a common question, right? 
like Jesus asking them out of concern, have you guys eaten? Like in Indonesia, when you walk into a house, makan sudah? That's the first question. Have you eaten? If you wake up in the morning, do you want breakfast? Out of kindness, right? It, there's nothing wrong with it. It's a very good character. So that's how it sounds like. Jesus was just concerned. Have you guys eaten? But when we look at the Greek, actually, there's so much revelation in that one question that we miss. Because the first word Jesus used was children, which they were not. They were all grown men that have walked with him, and I'm sure many of them were maybe older than him. But he used that word, which in Greek means an infant, but it also means an immature Christian. So Jesus was saying, hey, when are you guys going to grow up? Not physically, spiritually. When are you going to get to the place that I say you are? As sons. And remember in the school of intimacy, we did the difference between a child and a son. It's not the same. In our English language or in our cultures, when someone is born as a boy, we call him a son. But it's not like that in the Hebrew culture. There's a huge difference between a child and a son. And Jesus was telling them, hey, are you going to stay babies forever? So that's the first thing. He wanted them to mature. He wanted them to get to the place that they could really be his sons. And then the, sec the, the second part of that question, he asked, do you have any fish? Or the original King James says meat. And once again, if you look at the Greek, the meaning is not just meat. It actually says something else added to your bread. So remember the first miracles Jesus did. When the multiplication came and they gathered the bread baskets, what does the word say? What was, what was the leftovers? What was in these baskets? Bread, right? And Jesus was sharing with them, I'm the bread. And remember later in that same chapter in Mark 6, Jesus are saying, your hearts are hardened because you do not understand about the bread. He didn't say anything about the fish. He said, your hearts are hardened because you don't get revelation about me just being the, the starting point, the bread. And that brings me back to what I shared last night. The cross is the starting point. But why did Jesus come? He said, I came that you can have life and life more abundantly. And I am the way and the truth and the life. And then the rest of that verse so what is the aim? Why did Jesus come? Is it just to die so we can go to heaven one day when we die? Or what was the purpose? Restoration with Abba, with the Father. That was the aim. It has never been to get rid of sin. The aim of the crucifixion, the aim of why Jesus came has always been restoration with Abba. So as long as we just eat the bread, do we go to heaven? Yes. But his heart is, and he was saying to them, even now I want you to eat more than just the bread. And that's why Paul, remember in Hebrews, he, he gets to them after a long time and he tells them, by now you are still drinking milk. I was hoping you were going to eat meat by now. And Jesus was saying the same thing. He was saying that how long will you just eat the bread? spiritually when are you going to get at that place where you are partaking of more than just the basic and then they answer him and they said no we have not we don't have and then they tell him why because they were toiling the whole night in the flesh and what was what is the lesson for us we can do religious things we can do a lot of things in the flesh with the right heart. They didn't go fishing that night with evil intention. Or they didn't go out and think, oh, you know what? We want to spend the whole night on the lake, but we don't want to catch anything. The intention was we want to, we want to catch fish. But the problem was 
It was in the flesh. They were good fishermen. It was their trade. It's not like sending me to catch a fish and then everyone goes hungry. They knew what they were doing, but were they where God wanted them? And what changed? The word says when, when Jesus was there and they answered him no, he said to them. So the first thing that changed was the presence of Jesus. During the whole night, as they were fishing, it was them by themselves. But now in the morning, Jesus came. And then he spoke to them. There was an instruction. And he said to them, cast the net on the right-hand side of the boat, and you will find some. Do you think it's just randomly that Jesus saw, oh, you know, on the left side there's no fish, so on the right side there are? No. What does the right-hand side present? Where is Jesus seated? On the right-hand side of the Father. So what was he saying? Everything that comes from the presence of God, from the, the leading of the Spirit of God, there will be fruit. But everything that comes from our flesh, that is done out of our own, will just make us tired. There will not be fruit. So Jesus gives them this instruction to go back. It was the same boat. It was the same nets. It was the same water. But two things changed. It was number one, his presence. And number two, his instruction. So in this new beginning that we all are going to walk, that we are all are entering, you can go back and do the same thing. And nothing changed. And you can be tired again in three, four months. Or you can go back and say, Lord, we've had two years of challenges. We had two years of uncertainties. We had two years of not being sure what next. But we have one assurance that you were always there. And continuing in what you want to do next, your presence is always there. But we don't want to just do what we have been doing. We want to do what you speak now. What are you instructing, Lord? What is the Holy Spirit saying for Lina moving to Hong Kong? What is the Lord saying? It's not just, in yes, maybe the reason was, was starting in, in, in a professional capacity. But there's something that the Father has ordained, that heaven has already prepared to say, my daughter, this is what you will reveal, what you will, will represent as you walk into that nation. So yes, we can, you can just be there in the flesh and maybe join a Bible study. Or you can know, wow, this is what Abba wants for me to be in Hong Kong. And that's the difference. It is not just to, to have him there, but to hear what he's saying in our new beginning, to get his instruction and to follow that. The, the, what made the nets to be filled was when they obeyed. They didn't just hear it. They actually went back. And I think for many of us, we would have said, no, we've tried it. It didn't work. But they didn't. They acted. Like we said here last night, faith is an action. Rest is an action. Surrender is an action. They took action. They went back. And what happened? The nets were filled. But the nets were not filled with a random number. The word says it's 153 fishes. You know that number prophetically has a meaning. And it has two Specific meanings. If you count the num numerical value, the first meaning is only God provides. And the second meaning of that number is sons of God. So what were the Lord saying? If you walk in this new beginning, if you walk in what I want you to do, and you are led by my spirit, I will provide for you to raise and bring in the sons of God. And that's why we cannot play church anymore. We cannot just be a believer that wake up, 
read our Bible, sing our song, and go to bed. The whole world is waiting for what? The manifestation of the sons of God. So for so long, all the only desire we had was just for people to get to know the Lord. But how will he how will they get to know him? How will people accept the Father? When Jesus became the Son, he was born as a child, right? That's what the word tells us. He was a child that was brought to the temple. The word says when he was at 12, teaching with so much wisdom, his mother said, where is the child? But how did the world recognize that he was not just another male figure? It's when he became the son. And we have been longing to bring souls to the Lord. We have been longing to see the world acknowledge that Jesus is, is, is the Lord of their life. We're not going to do it through religious programs. We're not going to do it through a kaka air. Because I've seen it. Huge millions come to a crusade in Africa. Amazing for two days. And I go to that same village six months later, and there's no fruit. There's no sons. Why? Because it's programmed. Can we do the, that same thing? Remember, they still went fishing. Like I say, they didn't suddenly, Jesus didn't suddenly say, now you can just walk on the water like this beautiful um, creation from Caroline. I hope you all have bought one by now. You are wearing this blessed dress coat. But Jesus didn't just tell them, hey, go walk on the water. They still went fishing. But there was a change. So yes, we will still do certain things. It's not passiveness. We're not just going to sit in the prayer towers and pray and the souls will come in. We still will go and do things, but it will be led by the Spirit of God. So that what? People can see through the sons that God is real, that he's a father that loves them, that they can experience it. You know, last night I prayed for someone and he said something and, and I shared it with a few of them. But when I went to bed, the word actually was a burden in my heart. And he said something. He said, you know what, Ankia, he's, he's not a believer yet. But he said something and he said, if you open a church in Singapore, I'll come. I said, oh, well, sorry, that's not my goal. <laughs> And then he said, you know why? I see rooms full of Christians many times, but they're all hypocrites. And that's so sad that when the world look at what's supposed to be the sons and the daughters, they don't see the fruit. You know, the young people that I journey with in Jakarta, there's a group between the age of 25 and 35, they all come from Christian families, but they don't want to serve God. And when I ask them why, they all have the same testimony. Because the Jesus, our parents, forced us to visit in the church, have never come to our house. Because my parents in church and the parents I knew, it's not the same. And that's sad. But it's not an excuse. And that's why I journey with them. Because don't look at your parents. God didn't change. But that's something we can change. That when the world look at us, whether it is on the golf course, or whether it is in the church, whether it is in the coffee shop, whether it is doing a business transaction, that they look and they say, wow, there's not a change. You know, she doesn't suddenly become somebody when she pray that her whole, whole voice language change, her vocabulary becomes so holy. But tomorrow evening, there's another transformation. Because Jesus was the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. And whether he was with Zacchaeus that he called from the tree or he was with the Pharisees, he was the same. And that's something that we have to love. We cannot be two different people. When we're at the Bible study, we want, but when you go home, you kick the dog, you shout at your kids, you scold the helpers. 
Because that's the first mission field, is the people in your house, your driver, your helper. Well, yeah, in Singapore, you guys don't have such a big mission field as in Jakarta. There's a huge mission field in every home in Jakarta. <laughs> but that's the starting point. And it doesn't mean you, you have to preach to them, but do they see Jesus in you? Even without speaking to them, do they encounter the Father? Every time you walk into the, the kitchen or you wake up in the morning, do they see, wow, something else has woken up? Or do they start shake? They say, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> ma'am is awake, trouble. <laughs> but then when the Bible study comes to the same house, oh, hallelujah, praise the Lord. <laughs> and the helper think, Hayo. <laughs> what happened? Because that's the reality. If we cannot be Jesus constantly, are we truly carrying him? Because he doesn't jump in and jump out. He's there constantly. And that's what the world needs to see through sons and daughters. Can we do it alone? For sure not. We need the Holy Spirit. We need that dependence on his presence and on his voice to speak, to comfort, to counsel. Somebody, I think it was Venture yesterday that shared, we were somewhere and, and, and something happened. Oh, the uncle was deaf. And he, he, the more she tried to tell him, hey, I'm just dropping her, the more he was writing the, the ticket. And she was so patient. And, you know, she said to me afterwards, you know, the old Finche would have not reacted this way. <laughs> And I said, but that is the beauty. You are growing. Yes. God is changing your character. Yes. From just scolding him and saying, okay, now, go, go, go. <laughs> to just patiently allowing him. And she was like, I'm going to leave now. And he just continued writing. She said, okay, let me just take it. It's okay. So if tomorrow the Lord sent her there to pray for him, he will accept it. Because it was not all the other Tai Tai that shouted at him. <laughs> it was someone that loved him. Yes. Amen? Yes. So that's the difference. As we start in this new beginning, it's not just to say, Lord, what do you want me to do? The most important is to say, who, want you, who do you want me to be with you? Yes. Because, yes, they were fishermen. That's what they did. But he wanted to be with them. And then, as they came, Jesus said to them, as they brought the fish, because then Peter recognized, wow, this is Jesus. And he quickly put on his, his, his clothes and he ran. And the other disciples brought the snake. And as they got there, Jesus said, bring the fish that you have caught. But in the same time, the Bible said they were already a fire with coal and fish on it. There were already fish, but still Jesus said, bring the fish that you caught. Why? Because he wants us to get to the place where the things that he entrusts us with, the things that he so abundantly add to us, we bring back to him. When you get to that place where you have that understanding, that's why so many people live from breakthrough to breakthrough. Because yes, there's the breakthrough, and then you hold on to it. And then you trust God for the next miracle, whether it is your child's salvation, whether it is your marriage, whether it is a, a business deal, or whether it is just shoes you need. But we never bring it back. We never make it a blessing. And that's what he said to them. He already provided the food. He was already cooking for them. But he said, bring the fish that you have caught. And if we can get to that place that out of the blessing that God entrusts to us, that we can give back, he will keep on pouring into our cup. And we won't have this roller coaster. Now we are full, our cup overflow. Next month, boom, rock bottom. Oh, my cup is leaking. There will come a constancy, consistency. Because the more the Lord can pour into you, the more he knows you can pour out. 
And that is everything. It's love. It is his goodness. It is encouragement. It is whatever he entrusts you to do. And then, and this is what I really trust him to do this morning. It says, and um, Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. So they brought, and when they have finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Remember when, when Peter denied Jesus, the last time he said, I don't know him. Do you know where he stood? Can you remember what the Bible say where he was? By the fire, right? He was standing near a fire. It was early morning before the, the crock crow. It was cold. He was attending to his flesh, standing at a fire. And his spirit, he neglected. Because in that moment, in his weakness, Jesus already knew that because Jesus told him, you're going to do it. But in the flesh, he said, no, me, Peter? Huh? No, maybe the others, but not me. That was all flesh. And what did he attain to at the end? He was standing at a fire, attending to his flesh, trying to keep warm. And what happened? He denied Christ. And Jesus come, revealing to them who he is, that he, from that place of being seated at the right hand of God, he wants to use them powerfully to raise up the sons of God. And then he restores Peter at the same place, at a fire. But this time, the flesh was already satisfied because Jesus already fed him. And he asked, he was, it's as if he said, now let's get to the real business. That what is important. And he asked him, do you agape me, Peter? And Peter said, no, Lord, you know I fill you, you. What's the difference? Jesus said, do you love me with that full compassion, with that full godly love? The same Peter that said, yeah, of course. Now said, no, Lord, you know I cannot. But I can only love as a friend. I can only fill you. And then Jesus said, he said, yes, Lord, you know that I love in English, but in the Greek it's filio, you, with a deep affection as a close friend. So Jesus said to him, feed my lambs. And a second time, because remember, he denied Jesus a second time. And again, Jesus asked him, Simon, son of John, do you love agape? me. And he said, yes, Lord, you know, I fill you, you. And then Jesus said, shepherd my sheep. And then a third time, because remember, it was three times. Jesus said to him, Simon, son of John, do you fill you, me? The third time, Jesus didn't ask again, do you agape me? But now he asked him, do you just love me as a friend? Because he knew. Out of our weakness, we can never get to that place. And now Peter said, yes, Lord, you know that I really love you. You know everything. And then Jesus said, feed my sheep. And, you know, sometimes it's easy for us to say with our mouth, I love the Lord, I love the Lord. Until reality checks in. And there's a challenge in front of us. And then our, about what we speak and how we react reflects something else. Just like Peter. But... Jesus didn't say to Peter, hey, remember I told you, you're going to do this. That was not his approach. But he guided him to get to that place where he said, Lord, you know, you know everything. And I can just love you with my limited love. 
And Jesus said, that's enough. That's all I want. You don't have to have it perfect. All I want you is to make me your friend. So no longer with Peter at the place of, oh, I can do it. Yes, I've got this perfect love, Lord. I've got it all together. No. Now he was at the place to say, no, Lord, I'm sorry. It's like that guy last night, he said, you know what, Anki, I'm a failure. I said, welcome to the club. So, I, so am I. But you know what? That failure, Anki, died. And he was like, huh? So you were raised from the dead? Yeah. <laughs> but because the Holy Spirit is in me. And that's a place that if we really, really want to walk in a new beginning as the end time, daughters and sons, we have to get to that place of really understanding what it means when we say, yes, God, we love you. It doesn't have to be a mask we wear. In the days that we are tired, we can be honest. and We can say, Lord, today I'm tired. I don't feel like praying for this woman I've prayed for 50 times and she doesn't, the penny doesn't drop. <laughs> but because you love her, Daddy, I will love her. I don't have to be a hypocrite. I can be honest. But then that love comes. And then he said, so feed my sheep. Become their shepherd. Knowing who you are. Knowing your shortcomings. He restored him. And I believe that is what God wants to do in all of us. He wants to restore that place. We cannot walk with him and trust him completely if that love is not restored in us first. You can do a lot of ministry. I mean, the forums can have programs every week. But if it's not truly from the love, the instruction, the guidance of the Holy Spirit, there will not be fruit. And we know there is fruit. We know what the Lord has done through the forerunners for so long. But what about what is next? The new beginning. And that's why you're going to get the scroll this afternoon. And those of you who did the School of Intimacy, you know that well that comes from the Bible, right? Is there anyone that don't know the story from the will that comes from the Bible? Okay. So there's this uncle in America. And one day, as he was reading the Bible, he felt that there's something coming from the Bible. And as he, I don't know if you wear or wiped it, but you can watch the YouTube video. The Bible kept producing oil, literal oil. It never stopped. And the Lord said, as long as you don't sell it, it will multiply. So they would put it in a container, and even if they pour out all the oil, the next day it will be filled again. So I have brought that oil to anoint you for this new beginning. So I don't believe that oil has a special power. But I believe when God gives us an instruction in obedience. So when I was praying about this and I stepped into the apartment in Jakarta, the Lord clearly said, I want you to anoint my sons and my daughters with this world. Because I want them to walk in the new beginning in the supernatural. I want them to understand that it's me that fill those nets far above what they think. But then it must come from a place of being restored in love. It cannot just be a program. It cannot just be an activity because there's a need. And that was the biggest struggle for me, doing ministry based on the need, because the need will always be there. And as long as you're willing to meet the need, even Jesus said, the poor, the hungry, the crooks, you will always have them with you. And that's what when ministry becomes a burden, not just ministry. For me, remember, ministry is not a function in a church or organization. 
Ministry is administering every day what God entrusts to you. That's ministry. It's not you having a ministry, a name, or a position. It is every day doing. Waking up saying, Abba, what are we doing today? That's ministry. And I believe, Anna, that this is what he desires. That as women, as daughters of the Most High, that the forerunners will really carry his presence. And that the forerunners will be those who, who will reveal sons and daughters that will bring in the harvest that's based on love. And it will not be a yoke. Because that's what Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 to 30 say. Those who are tired and heavy burdened come to me and I'm going to put a double portion of burden and yoke on you. Is that what it says? But when I look at some of the pendetas, oh, heavy yoke. The joy people lose. If the Lord calls you and you are walking in what he has, it's not a burden. Doesn't mean everything goes right and smooth. No. Will there be challenges? Yes. But that's when in the middle of the storm you can sleep. He doesn't say there's not a storm. But what are you doing in the storm? Are you sleeping like Jesus? Because you know where you're going? Why did Jesus sleep? He told the disciples, hey, we're going over. But what happened? The moment there was a storm, oh, we're going to die in the middle of the sea. No, he said you're going over. So don't worry. That's why I wasn't afraid of Corona. Because God told me, you're going to be old and still preach. So Corona cannot kill me in 2020. Because I know. I know where I'm going. But if we don't know, we get stuck in the ocean and there's a storm. Anxiety comes. Fear comes. But Jesus was sleeping. Why? He knew he was about to die. It wasn't long after that. But he knew it's not there. He knew it's going to be the cross. If you know, you don't have to be afraid. Yeah. Then anxiety doesn't have to be part of your life. Then it's peace. So that yoke that he says, I put on you, is a blessing. He says it has a purpose and it's light. Why? Because he walks in front and you follow, not the other way around. And that's what we do many times. We get an idea and then we ask, God, bless my idea. Make it work together for good. <laughs> and out of grace, he does. Thank God, many times. I think heaven wakes up and says, oh, man, Anka is awake, so trouble again. <laughs> Angels, just help her. <laughs> And out of grace, but when you get to the place to say, okay, Lord, help me. Anna's always say, you know, you don't just run in front of, you know, there's a saying that don't, don't, um, in Afrikaans, on say, meaning don't put your, your cart in front of the horses. Yeah. But Hannes tells me, no, you like Elijah. The horses and the cart are still coming and you're already running. <laughs> And that's true, but I know that. So I can be like Peter. Oh, Lord, you know. So if I jump and the parachute's not there, please send the angels. <laughs> and he teaches me. Oh, that's why he gave me a husband. That can say, oh, come back. <laughs> You're running. You're running alone now. <laughs> the Lord is still here. Wait. Because it's my character. There's no more time. We need souls. You can sit and sleep. But if you do it on your own, whole night, wake up. Huh? No fish, Lord. The whole night. I was praying. Huh? I didn't ask you. Last night I said sleep. <laughs> so I'm, I, I'm still learning that. Because my heart is pure. But don't be yoked with things that come from a need. It must come from the presence, from the right hand of the Father. And when he tells you, hey, this is what you do, it becomes a blessing. 
And then as you catch the fish, you can give the fish. It's just this flow of heaven on earth. Heaven on earth. Amen? So this morning, um, as we're going to take a break, uh, I think we're a bit late. We're supposed to move out here at 12 o'clock, right? Uh, yeah. Yes. It's like a bit for one. Yeah. One yeah, o'clock. Like yeah. one. Okay, because this session is really important to me. Yeah. Um, I want us really to take the time. And I want you to allow the Holy Spirit to minister to you that love. And I want you to see it. I want us really to take time to, to ask the Lord, if you see yourself in this lake catching fish, because that's what we've all been called to do. We've all been called to prepare the bride of Christ for his coming. We are all part of his heart in different ways. Some to cook, some to preach, some to sing, some to just be, some to pray, some to wash feet. Whatever it is, there's no more important job description in the kingdom of God. Everything is equal. We are all part of it in different ways. But what I want is really to, to prepare our hearts for this new beginning to walk in it, is to ask ourselves this morning, his presence, will it be a constant in our lives? Not just when we are getting together or when it's prayer meeting or, you know, when you are in your prayer room at home. Number two, will we hear what he releases out of his throne room, his heart, from the right hand of the Father? And then I want you to see yourself standing at a fire with him this morning. Because at the end of the day, that fire that was... Peter was standing next to, a few days later, became a fire that was now in him. And that's where we have to get to. Not just standing next to the fire, not just allowing the Holy Spirit to be there. And when we need him, we just put something in. And, you know, it's like kids. In South Africa, we have braai, you know. You all know we braai a lot. So if, if, if the kids, if they're little, they put the stick in the fire and the the, the, with the marshmallows, and then after they've eaten it, they want to burn the stick. And the, the stick will make like a little coal, and if they turn it, but as soon as you take it out, if the stick is not dry, that small little light quickly fades. But if that fire, you leave the stick there, it keeps glowing. And that's with us. I believe the Lord doesn't just want us to stand next to the fire. I believe more than ever, he wants his sons and his daughters to become the fire. Amen. Not to carry a torch anymore, but to be the torch. That wherever we walk, that consuming fire is who we become. Because the Holy Spirit is now in us. But we cannot get there if we don't stop and pause next to the fire and check our hearts and allow him to restore us. And that is really my prayer for this morning, that we will see ourselves again standing next to the fire with the Lord and asking him, just like Peter responded. And maybe for all of us, it's a different place of restoration. But I believe he wants to restore us, each one of us, so that we can be who he longs the world to see that he is. We are not human doings. We are human beings carrying the presence of the living God, revealing who he is. 